as well as the seasoned musicians who were appreciative of his craft, Jeff also had a ready-made audience amongst those who had known and loved his father's work. People my age all flocked to see Jeff, you know, because we were so... Uh, just to hear that voice again, he would have been so pissed off with it by now. Fuck off, just fuck off. All these old, you know, toothless hags hanging around the stage door, you know. I knew your dad. Well, I didn't. With Jeff, I mean, what, what stage of Jeff's career did you actually become aware of, aware of him and his work? He was playing at the garage um, on his own. He didn't have a band. I don't know what year that was. It was probably fairly early. I mean, you know, there was a short career. Um, but, uh, and then he was standing next to me at the bar afterwards, so we started talking. And I was, uh, actually had a rehearsal studio, uh, which we'd been working at that day, just around the corner, and I said, hey, do you want to come around and... Uh, I'd gone to see him with John McEnroe, actually, who was in town. So, um, and Jeff was just there on his own, maybe with a very small crew, if any crew, I don't remember. It was just him uh, playing guitar. Uh, I asked John to give him a hand with his amps, and that was fun to see, <laughs> to see John uh, acting as a roadie for this kid. And w anyway, we all went round to my rehearsal studio and had a kind of a jam, or he had kind of a jam. I, I was mesmerized. He was such a great guitar player, Jeff. That seems to be something that people have... I think when someone's a good singer and songwriter, you tend to overlook that. But he, he was a shit-hot guitar player. He really, he really blew us away that night when we yeah. saw what he, could, was, what he was really up to with the guitar. He, um, he tells a very interesting story about Jeff Buckley and you. John does? Yeah, John McElroy Oh, does. we'll have to compare notes on that. Yeah, we went to see Jeff. He was playing upstairs at the garage in Islington. Oh, and, wow, um, that's a tiny actually, venue. I, it was tiny. And actually, I, John and I both had, you know, deadly hangovers. Uh, and I, I'm not sure how much we absorbed of the of that uh, gig. But uh, after after Jeff played, he uh, walked over to me and started talking to me at the bar. I was a bit embarrassed because I was so not uh, present for the for his show, really. But and so I got John to help them carry their gear down the stairs. So that was a good look to see Johnny Mac, you know, humping big uh, flight cases. Well, there wasn't much gear. It's a tiny place yeah. down the stairs. Then we, we went around to a um, rehearsal studio I was using just around the corner. And uh, Jeff knew every single uh, Pretender solo from the first two albums. And, um, and we just, I don't know what, what John said about that night. Well, he said that um, about you really kind of, you need to be reminded of the respect that you have because John McEnroe pointed out that Jeff Buckley knew every note. It wasn't this that he could just play a kind of pastiche version of Pretender songs. He was obsessed with your music. And I thought well, it was he was obsessed with, uh, certainly with James Honeyman Scott, my guitar player. James Honeyman Scott, he really was one of the last of the greats. And all my subsequent guitar, Jimmy died when he was 25, so he didn't get a chance to make as much of a mark. But in the short amount of time he had, he certainly influenced everyone I've worked with. Johnny Marr, James Walborn, Adam Seymour. Um, everyone I've uh, worked with has been a very influenced by Jimmy Scott. Um, and Jeff Buckley was a, I mean, I like to think he was a fan of mine too, but I really think it was down to James Sonny and Scott. Mm, maybe that's your modesty, Chrissy, uh, more than the reality of well, the Well, I don't have any false modesty. No. I genuinely am modest. Yeah. Well, I mean, I read that story that John McEnroe recounted and it was, you know, it was uh, extraordinary. I mean, that